Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming and for supporting the Mises Institute. And uh, I thought uh, since we have such a big topic, freedom versus big government, uh, it would fit right into my uh, one of my books, How Capitalism Saved America. And, uh, and so I'm not going to talk about the whole book, of course, in a half hour. But uh, one of the themes of this book uh, is that um, uh, government has always relied on a system of lies and myths about itself and about the civil society uh, in order to solidify its power. Uh, the, 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 uh, the private enterprise system is rapacious, it's monopolistic, uh, it, uh, it's polluting. Uh, you need government to save you from it. And the same is true for the civil society. It's never, it's never adequate uh, to help poor people or to help people who need food. You need government to do all those things. And as Murray Rothbard wrote in, in a number of his books, uh, it's not just the government uh, itself who spreads these these uh, myths and, and and tall tales. It always relies on a a band of court historians, uh, propagandists, uh, and excuse makers uh, in in the in the rest of society. That's why people like Paul Krugman, for example, have jobs as New York Times columnists. That's basically their their job. And and economic misinformation has always been a part of this. It's always been a part of this. If you read the latter chapters of Human Action by Ludwig von Mises, he addresses this, uh, you know, very, you know, very specifically after after you know completing his great masterpiece, that uh, <clears throat> you know, economic misinformation is a big part of uh, what keeps the state alive and, and growing. And so I'm going to give a few examples of this based on uh, uh, how capitalism saved America, despite the myths about capitalism in. In, in early America, and then uh, in the last 15 minutes, I'll explain how government is destroying America. That's my job for 20, 25 minutes, I guess. But it began at the very beginning, at the very, very beginning of the American Republic, uh, uh, an expression of the so-called free rider problem was enunciated by none other than Alexander Hamilton, the first Treasury Secretary, who made the case that in order to build roads and canals, uh, the private capital would never be sufficient for that. And so he was the first champion of uh, what we today would call pork barrel spending. Uh, you know, you know they, they had to put a picture of Hamilton. Instead of having his picture on the currency, his picture should be on every one of those orange cones on the interstate uh, that, that, that you pass. That, that's really a, a much more uh, important part of his, of his legacy. And, and so... And so, so there was a, this was part of the real big economic policy debate of the early 19th century, uh, where you had all the statists lined up, people like Hamilton uh, and, uh, and his followers. And then uh, there was great opposition uh, you know, uh, from uh, Jefferson to Madison to Monroe to uh, 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 Andrew Jackson. And uh, Andrew Jackson said one of the greatest achievements of his presidency was he vetoing pork barrel spending programs that were called internal improvements. But the governments finally did get around to that. State and local governments finally did get around to, to spending a good bit of money on uh, road and canal building. And it was an unmitigated disaster in almost every instance. And uh, to give you one example, uh, that uh, there's a historian named John Bach McMaster uh, who wrote a book about this. And he said, uh, in every state, every state, which had gone this recklessly into internal improvements in the early 19th century, the financial situation was alarming. No works were finished. Nothing was finished in any state. Little or no income was derived from them. Interest on in the bonds increased day by day, and no means of paying it, save by taxation, remained. It was such a debacle in state after state after state that by the time you get to 1850, Every state except Massachusetts had amended its constitution to make it illegal for tax dollars to go to any corporation for any reason whatsoever. But it was primarily the road building and canal building subsidies that uh, you would, today we would call this stimulus spending. Uh, but it was such a catastrophe, they didn't just pass laws, they amended their constitutions to make it even more difficult to bring back this, this thing. And it was quite, quite the catastrophe all around the country. And here's, here's a one example, uh, and he, as Doug mentioned, I've written a couple of books on Lincoln, uh, and he was, he was the Illinois champion of, of this. Uh, this was part of the Whig Party agenda. And he, and, so, and he was very instrumental in getting about $12 million from the state legislature in Illinois in 1837 to start building roads and canals all across the state. And here's what his law partner, William Herndon, said about it. 
The gigantic and stupendous operations of the scheme dazzled the eyes of nearly everybody, but in the end, it rolled up a debt so enormous as to impede the otherwise marvelous progress of Illinois. The burdens imposed by the legislature under the guise of improvements became so monumental in size, it is little wonder that intervals uh, for years after the monster of debt repudiation often showed its hideous face above the waves of popular indignation. And this is uh, Lincoln's uh, law partner, William Herndon, saying this. So it was a disaster for the people of Illinois like uh, every other state. And, and, but in the meantime, the private sector uh, was quietly going along, building roads and canals and doing it profitably and successfully and efficiently. There's an economist named Daniel Klein who wrote an article some years ago in an economic journal uh, about what happened in the first several decades of the 19th se century with private sector road building. Uh, you know, so, so we had this disaster with the government road and canal building everywhere. And here's what he says. The private road building movement built new roads at rates previously unheard of. Over 11 million was invested in turnpikes in New York, 6.5 million in New England, over 4.5 million in Pennsylvania between 1794 and 1840. There were 238 private New England turnpike companies alone that built and operated 3,700 miles of road. New York led all states. Uh, New Jersey companies operated 500 miles by the year 1821. Then between 1810 and 1845, over 400 private turnpikes were chartered and built. And so from the very beginning of the Republic, you had this myth all of a sudden that the private sector cannot build roads. The government must take it over. Exactly the opposite of what actually happened. The private sector actually uh, produced. It actually built the roads and did a very good job of it. And the government sector made a big mess of everything it touched. Whenever, uh, even the Erie Canal, the famous Erie Canal, that was profitable, did make money for, for many years. But of course, uh, who can't make money when the taxpayers are coerced to pay all your infrastructure spending and, the, and all your capital expenses? And so the defenders of this, uh, even to this day in the academic world, point to the fact that it made money. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, well, in one of my uh, academic papers that I'm working on uh, now, I, I point out uh, what seemed to me to be the obvious fact is that it was built at around the same time where railroads were coming into uh, into being. And one of, one of the uh, uh, arguments that modern economists make about why the market fails is they say it's sometimes in the marketplace, inferior technology is locked in by the free market for whatever reason, and we're all forced to suffer for decades with this inferior technology. Well, think about this, the Erie Canal, how to transport goods from the Midwest to, uh, to the New York area. Uh, you, put, you put your grain on a barge and you have donkeys drag it through, through a ditch across the state of New York. At the same time, they're building railroads, okay? So what was locked in was the donkey dragging barges when at the same time we had railroads. And of course, eventually the railroads superseded the Erie Canal. But, uh, but that's another example of how even modern economists who study the history, American economic history, seems to me have it backwards again, where they, they praise the Erie Canal for being a marvelous success, when in fact it did lock in an inferior technology, donkey-driven barge dragging, compared to uh, uh, the locomotive that, that was being used. And they unfairly competed with the locomotives in New York State at the, at the time also. And so uh, another example of this is um, the building of the transcontinental railroads that, I, that I've written about. And the same argument was made that private capital would never be sufficient to build the transcontinental railroads. Uh, well, a man named James J. Hill proved that wrong. Uh, he, he built the Great Northern from Minnesota to the West Coast. And uh, he, div he, divide he built the most efficient route, the, the quickest route, shortest route. Whereas the, the government subsidized transcontinentals, um, there were some beginning in the Lincoln administration, the, uh, uh, the Central Pacific and, and, uh, and the, the Union Pacific, they, uh, they were built, the routes there, if you look at a map of their routes, it looks like a cobweb because every politician all the way out from the Midwest to the West Coast uh, made the argument that in return for my vote for the subsidies, you have to run a line to my district to my area. And so it looked, you know, looked kind of like this, rather than a straight line from Minnesota to California, it looked kind of, kind of like this with, uh, you know, like a cobweb, and it was extraordinarily inefficient. And if you read the history of this, uh, also, uh, it's, it's a, a, a dramatic contrast between uh, the efficiency of James J. Hill 
and the, the gross inefficiency and then eventually corruption of the government-run railroads, even though uh, uh, even to this day we're told that uh, the free rider problem made it necessary for government subsidies. Here's uh, in a biography of uh, James J. Hill, uh, someone, uh, the biographer uh, Burton Folsom wrote, Hill's quest for short routes, low grades, and few curvatures was an obsession. Well, he was a businessman. He went the quickest route to the West Coast. In 1889, Hill conquered the Rocky Mountains by finding the legendary Marias Pass. Lewis and Clark had described a low pass through the Rockies back in 1805, but, but later no one seemed to know whether it really existed or if it did, where it was. Hill wanted the best gradient so much so that he hired a man to spend months searching western Montana for the pass. He shortened his route by almost 100 miles. And so James J. Hill was the kind of businessman who left no rock unturned, and he built the greatest transcontinental railroad. And if you, you can compare this to the, uh, the government-subsidized uh, railroads, which was just a carnival of inefficiency, uh, my favorite story about this was how the government-subsidized roads, actually, they were subsidized per mile by the U.S. government. And so they built railroad tracks on the top of 10 feet of ice pack in, uh, at the beginning of the winters in the Rocky Mountains. And then when the ice would melt in the spring, it's all good because they get paid again. They would rebuild the, the track, and they would get paid twice for the same track. That's how they made their profits. And so, uh, and so that's the second example I would offer of um, the, the myth building that occurred in, in early America about, uh, about the, the evils of the civil society and private enterprise system and the need for government to intervene and take over. And, uh, and of course, there's the, uh, the, the myth of the robber barons. Now, there were real robber barons, and, uh, and uh, I would hold out an example of uh, Leyland Stanford, uh, the, man, the man who, uh, the founder of uh, Stanford University, he was the United States Senator and Governor of California, and uh, he used his political connections to make it illegal for anyone to compete with his railroad in the state of California. And even a college professor like me could make money if, it's, if I was in a business, a legitimate business, and it was illegal for anyone to compete. I could make money for a while anyway, at least until golf season arrived, uh, <laughs> uh, as far as that goes. But, uh, so he was a real robber baron, but, uh, but others in the, in the same industry, like James J. Hill, were not. And, uh, and neither was uh, Rockefeller, uh, neither was John D. Rockefeller in his oil business. Um, back back when, uh, when Microsoft was being uh, prosecuted by the U.S. government, the, the judge in the case, was his name was Thomas Penfield Jackson, and he was eventually kicked off. He was eventually fired from the case by the three federal judge panel that hired him in the first place because of his bias. He gave a, uh, an interview to, um, uh, I think it was Atlantic Monthly Magazine, where he compared Bill Gates to Al Capone, and that was a little too much. Uh, that, that, was like, that would be like the judge in the O.J. Simpson murder trial uh, uh, just flippantly saying to the Los Angeles Times, yeah, O.J., he's a murderer, before the verdict came in. And, and, so, uh, and so he was kicked off of there. But before that, uh, he gave an interview say, saying that Bill Gates was just like John D. Rockefeller. He compared Microsoft to the old standard oil business of John D. Rockefeller. And one of my articles I wrote years ago on Mises.org said he's right. He's absolutely right about that. Uh, because, you know, how did, how did Rockefeller make his money? Well, here's basically how he made his money. His chief critic was a woman named Ida Tarbell, uh, one of the famous muckraking journalists. And her brother was the treasurer of the Pure Oil Company, which was driven from the market by the lower price Standard Oil. So she had, she had a grudge. And, uh, but even Ida Tarbell uh, described the Standard Oil as, quote, a marvelous example of economy in, in, in her book. She wrote a book called A History of the Standard Oil Company. And here's how Rockefeller made his money. The price of refined petroleum fell from 30 cents in 1869. He founded his company in 1866 to 10 cents by 1874 and 5.9 cents in 1897. So he caused the price of refined petroleum to, to decrease from 30 cents to about 6 cents in 1897. 1898, he's sued by the federal government for violating the antitrust laws. And dur during that time, his market share peaked in 1890, around the time he was sued, at 88%. But by the time uh, the verdict finally came down on the antitrust suit, the year 1911, he still had over 300 competitors, and his market share was 11%. And so he was anything but a monopoly. 
But this was a, a classic case of how antitrust usually works. It demonizes a successful entrepreneur for cutting prices for decades and cutting costs and improving products and inventing many new products too. You know, Vaseline and things like that were, were part of the inventions that came out of the Rockefeller uh, organization. And then, and at the same time saying, we, the government, need to protect you by, with our new antitrust law. And so, uh, and so they did, so they broke up the Standard Oil, Standard Oil Company. And, uh, and, and of course, there's a one theory that is used to defend the breakup of Standard Oil uh, by the economic, uh, economically uninitiated, and it's called predatory pricing. The, uh, the argument basically goes that uh, Rockefeller intentionally lose money, lost money on every barrel of oil for 30 years in hopes of driving all the competition from the market. And then at that place, that point, then he could charge the sky's the limit and make a lot of money. That's essentially what they call predatory pricing. Uh, and uh, I, some of my MBA students uh, who, who work uh, at Black & Decker in Baltimore, uh, I asked them what their supervisor would say if they went back to work after taking my Saturday class and, and, made, and said that. So here's how we're gonna make money. You know, this drill that costs us $50 to manufacture, let's start selling it for $10. It might take 10 years, but we'll, we'll eliminate everybody else from the world market for drills, and then we'll really make a killing. And of course, they said I would be fired the, the, on the spot. There's no way I would keep my job if I was giving that kind of advice. And yet that's what people believe about John D. Rockefeller, because this demonization of private enterprise uh, has gone on to this day about, about this. Uh, one more example of... Uh, of sort of the backwards history that I'll give about, uh, about this is uh, how the Great Depression ended. A lot, a lot of you know this. Uh, maybe, uh, I guess a lot of you know the untruth. About, uh, probably more of you know the untruth about how the Great Depression ended. Uh, World War II did not end the Great Depression. Uh, World War II ended unemployment because when you had uh, 5 million people unemployed and you draft 11 million men and send them to war, that's a pretty good way of ending unemployment, isn't it? Uh, but of course, those men uh, lived a very different life in the military in Europe and Asia than they would have lived back at home returning to their families every night after work. And so, uh, yeah, unemployment ended. Uh, but, but the consumer part of the economy, the private part of the economy was actually worse during World War II because of all the resources that were allocated for the war. Uh, you know, there's rationing and, and things like that. But what really ended finally, the Great Depression, was the demobilization of the army after World War II when the, the, uh, the federal budget was reduced from about $95 billion in 1945 to $35 billion in 1947. There was a two-thirds cut in the federal budget in absolute dollars in two years. And as a result, 1946 was the, 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 the most successful year of the American economy ever in the private sector. Private sector spending, consumer and investment spending, increased by about 15% in one year. And, uh, and, and, and it's uh, probably the most successful year ever in American history. Uh, and, you know, and, but you, most people have never heard of this because it totally blows out of the water the idea of Keynesianism. The idea that a massive spending cuts reduce aggregate demand and therefore uh, the economy will go into a depression. Uh, that didn't happen. The opposite happened uh, for, uh, about that. And so this is just an example of the things I write about. I guess the first part of my talk here is an advertisement for my book, How Capitalism Saved America. Uh, but that's uh, when I, the, the, uh, the reason I wrote this book was uh, right after the, uh, the Enron scandal. You might remember the Enron scandals of uh, some years ago, the accounting scandals. Uh, my publisher at Random House uh, called me up and said, uh, you know, Michael Moore and people like that are going to be writing books arguing that this is inherent in capitalism, that this crookedness and corruption is inherent. It's not just Enron, it's everywhere. And sure enough, that was pretty much uh, what, uh, what we heard. And so, uh, and so he, he recommended to me that I write a book, sort of a defense of capitalism, sort of similar to Ayn Rand's old book, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, but uh, using historical examples of how capitalism did save America. So that that's, was the genesis. Um, of that as far as that goes. And so, uh, you know, the second half of my topic that I gave uh, uh, Doug to talk about is how government is destroying America. And, uh, well, we could talk all day about that, couldn't we? Uh, how government is destroying America. But I decided I'd just mention two things, uh, the current boom and bust and uh, government employee unions. Uh, so the, and so the current boom and bust, of course, 
The Austrian uh, view, is, which I believe is the correct view, is that the Fed is the main culprit here. And of course, the first thing Alan Greenspan did is to blame uh, uh, the whole thing on the fact that uh, people in, uh, in Asia save too much of their money. They don't spend enough. They save too much. I'm not making this up. He said this in one of his numerous autobiographies that uh, they, they drove down the world, uh, world interest rates by saving too much. And of course, that's, uh, that's bogus. That's, uh, it's, it was the Fed that created the housing bubble, uh, which has now burst. And not only that, uh, they, 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 at the same time that we had the housing bubble, we, had, uh, we were in the middle of about a 15-year uh, period where the U.S. government was doing everything it could do to, to pressure or even extort banks and mortgage lenders into making bad loans to unqualified borrowers. Uh, this began in the 70s with the Community Reinvestment Act, which essentially did that, uh, forcing banks to make dubious loans that they would not normally have made. But that act was greatly strengthened during the Clinton administration. And then it was, uh, it was people like Barney Frank and other members of Congress who, inst who instructed Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to purchase trillions of dollars of these bad loans and bundle them uh, and securitize them, so-called, and sell them. And of course, with an implicit wink-wink government guarantee because it was a quasi-governmental operation, operation, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And uh, Doug mentioned, I testified at Ron Paul's hearing a couple weeks ago, Barney Frank himself was there and he was still bragging about this. He was bragging that we increased home ownership from 60% to 69% in America. And, patting themselves on the back uh, for this thing. And this, this is just evil. Uh, and, and so among the, the, the uh, methods they use for this is if you want to see what they did, go online and, and Google Boston Fed closing the gap. Boston Fed closing the gap. You'll find a report by the Boston Federal Reserve Board uh, instructing mortgage lenders in how to close the housing gap that is, there's a gap between people who can afford a house and people who cannot. And so the Fed said, we're going to close that gap. And, and here, it's among their recommendations to mortgage lenders, if it's low income or minority borrowers, they said, don't ask for income requirements. Don't ask for a, a, a pay stub. Uh, don't do a credit check, unnecessary. It, just if they're enrolled in a credit counseling program, that's fine. And I would think, by definition, if you're in credit counseling, you've had problems with your counseling over, over credit. No assets to back up the loan. Don't worry about that also. And also, uh, if the appraisal on the house comes in with the wrong number, see us, the Fed, we'll find another appraiser for you. I was always told that that's, you can get in trouble by doing that, maybe even go to jail. You know, that's a fraud. Uh, but here's the, the Fed uh, doing this. And then all, at the same time the Fed is publishing this, this very same publication threatens uh, mortgage lenders with class action lawsuits if they don't do these things. And so, uh, and so that, and at the same time, the, now and then when the bubble burst, the Fed comes out and says, we've got to do something about all this systemic risk that is created by the free market out there. Uh, you know, if, if this sort of thing, you know, strong arming mortgage lenders to make bad loans to unqualified borrowers. If that doesn't create systemic risk, what does? Uh, and so, but of course the Fed uses this as government always does. It uses a problem that it created to justify and rationale giving itself even more powers. And that's exactly what it, what it did. Um, and, and so that's, that's um, you know, how, the, how well, example number one and how government is destroying America with the boom and bust cycle. And it was, it was uh, surreal to see Barney Frank and his fellow Democrats on this uh, congressional committee literally congratulating themselves for a job well done and, and, and refusing to accept any criticism of any kind of what the Fed, Fed did. They're not the least bit interested uh, in that. They would do the same again tomorrow if they got back in power and, and just start this up all over again. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is the state and local government uh, uh, mess where the Wall Street Journal uh, reported recently that uh, state and local governments have about three and a half trillion dollars in unfunded pension liabilities. And that's, that's in addition to everything else. That's just unfunded pension liabilities. And, uh, and this really brought to mind uh, uh, 
what I've learned and written about for years about government employee unions and the power. Some of you may remember or have read about when Ronald Reagan fired the uh, air traffic controllers. Uh, I think the union, the acronym for the union was PATCO. And, uh, and the reason he fired them was that it, there was a federal law that made it illegal for them to go on strike. Uh, because in return for a monopoly on air traffic control, uh, the government said no striking. You can't go on strike because you can close the whole country down in terms of air travel. And, and that's tremendous power. You see, when they have the, if a union has the ability to shut down an entire industry like that, it has tremendous leverage to cause a tax increase, a tax increase to finance its wage demands. That's why it goes on strike. And so essentially it transfers the power to tax from the taxpayers, the voters, to the labor union. It gives them grossly disproportionate power over what the taxes are to be. And that was really the rationale for making it illegal for Petco to go on strike. And so all Reagan did was say, I just took the oath of office to enforce the laws. This is against the law. You're fired. And he hired replacement workers. And, and of course, uh, this is true in, in government employee unions everywhere. That it's not, it's not true that it's illegal for them to strike, but it's true that they have this disproportionate power Whereas, uh, you know, when the teachers unions go on strike in a city, they can shut down all the schools. Whereas if a grocery store, the employees of a grocery store go on strike, well, you can just shop at another grocery store and the store owner has the freedom to hire replacement workers. And so uh, compared to that, uh, you know, the teachers go on strike, they shut down the whole school system and civil service regulations usually make it impossible to hire replacement workers for government bureaucrats. Or if the garbage collectors, the city garbage department collecting department goes on strike, uh, the whole place is a mess. This, this used to be called the British disease back in England in the 70s when, when uh, the British economy imploded. And we're, we're seeing the British disease in America uh, now. And, and, and this is a big reason why um, the late Milton Friedman referred to government bureaucracies as economic black holes, he said, where you know, normally with an economic relationship, in, greater inputs lead to greater output. You hire more people for your business. Why do you do that? Because you think you have more orders, more customers. You're going to produce more stuff and sell it. With government, the more inputs, the less is the output more often than not. The more money we spend on public schools, the dumber the kids get. Uh, the more money we spend on uh, poverty programs, the more poverty th there is, and on and on and on. And so Friedman, uh, he, he said this in an essay called uh, Input and Output in Medical Care, which is published online by the Hoover Institution, where he did a study of, as government has taken over more and more of the healthcare sector, he said, uh, we began to see this. We began to see more inputs more money, more, more beds, more doctors, but less, uh, lesser health care. Uh, he, he made that case. Okay. And so, uh, so that's, that's one of the reasons uh, we're in trouble at the state and local government. It's the incentive system that exists with government employee unions. And uh, another problem uh, th that they create is that, uh, think of the, in the incentives here. If you're the mayor of a city or even the, the, the governor of, of a state, and you have a, a government unionized workforce, uh, and they're demanding more money, as they always do. They're demanding more money. If you give them a pay raise today, you're going to have to raise taxes somehow. That loses votes. So it makes you unpopular, you the governor, the mayor, whoever it is, you're unpopular, you lose votes. You win the support of the union, but you lose votes. It's not great. However, if you, get, if you offer them modest wage increases, but promise them the moon with retirement, that's the perfect recipe. Because when the bill comes due, you, the governor or the mayor, will be long retired, maybe even dead. So it's the perfect recipe for deferring or delaying the cost of selling out to the unions and avoiding a strike, avoiding the schools shutting down, avoiding the garbage not being collected for three weeks, and all the other things. Because if that does happen, you, the governor or the mayor, will catch hell. You know, the, the people are going to complain. Why isn't the garbage collected? Why aren't the kids in school? You're responsible. It's not the unions that are responsible. It's you, the elected official. And so uh, the, it's a win-win situation for politicians to give uh, government employee unions uh, extravagant pension promises, uh, even, if, even if the wages uh, don't increase too extraordinarily, which they do. I, I, I used to write in the area of labor economics, and there's an economist named uh, Sharon Smith that I can remember 30 years ago, she was publishing in some of the big economic journals 
uh, uh, the, the wage premium that government employees were getting. And, and, and uh, on average, they were, even then, they were being paid, uh, and according to her research, as much as 40% more than equally educated, equally qualified private sector employees. And these things change year by year. But so it's been um, the point I'm making. It's been alone known for a long time that even the wages are sometimes out of sync compared to the private sector uh, when you compare the unionized workforce and the government. And of course, uh, another thing that's uh, uh, an element of the incentive system with government employee unions is because of civil service regulations, uh, it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to fire a, a government bureaucrat unless some extraordinary crisis occurs like in Wisconsin uh, today. And so what do you do if you can't fire uh, the government bureaucrat? Uh, to fire, to fire the, this person, uh, the union will immediately file a lawsuit that's what they do because the, the unions are all about maximizing uh, dues revenue. That's what they maximize. They don't maximize, that's their profit. Uh, the more union members, the more revenue. The fewer union members, less revenue. And so they'll fight in, in, in the courts uh, when you try to lay off a government bureaucrat. And so if you're a manager of a government enterprise and you, you really want to get rid of this person, uh, what do you do? Well, you offer them a pay raise and a promotion. Uh, and, and in the case of teachers' unions, that might mean uh, get the math teacher who can't add and get her some job or him some job in the central administrative office and give them the duty of administering the whole school system along with the other teachers who can't teach. And, and, that's, and, and that's why in big cities all over America, you have these gigantic monst bureaucratic monstrosities, these centralized administrative office, and that's who's there. It's all the teachers who are so horrible that they would go, not everybody, but they would go from school to school to school. Parents would complain bitterly, my, my math teacher can't add and subtract, uh, and so forth. And, and then finally, the, you know, the superintendent would give up and uh, uh, can't fire them. Uh, they have tenure, give them an administrative job. And so, uh, so in, unlike the private sector, uh, failure is actually rewarded in, in the, with, with regard to uh, employees. And also, unlike the private sector, where you have an incentive to minimize the number of employees that are on the payroll to, to, uh, to do a job, in, in the government sector, the, the incentive is to maximize the number of employees because every, every government bureaucrat is worth at least two votes. You can count on every government bureaucrat to get a, a spouse or, a, or an adult child or a friend or a brother or sister to vote for the guy who gave you the job. And so to a mayor or a governor, patronage jobs, uh, is, so what uh, you used three people instead of two on the garbage truck to collect the garbage, like the private sector does, for example. Uh, it's all good to the politicians because it's more, more votes and more patronage jobs. So there's a built-in incentive to use more people than you're necessary to do the job. That's why one of the reasons why all these studies that have been done comparing private and government sector service provision uh, uh, have come up with what uh, economist Thomas Borcherding calls a bureaucratic rule of two. If you ever transfer some function, garbage collection, whatever, from the private sector to the government sector, on average it'll double the u per unit cost and, and quality will probably go down too. And, and this of course is, is one of the reasons uh, that this happens. So uh, the government unions are champions of feather bedding. And of course, uh, the final purpose of the government union is that they are relentless propaganda machines who uh, will always make uh, the argument that if you, if you are against their particular program of what they're doing, say they're administering poverty programs, if you criticize what they're doing, then you're, you hate poor people. Uh, that, that's, what, that's, that's, that's your motivation. Uh, okay, or if you're criticizing what the public teachers unions are doing, well, you must hate children, obviously. And, and uh, Friedrich Bastiat pointed this out in his famous essay, The Law, which is probably for sale um, uh, out back, uh, the socialist of his day. This is the 1840s. Uh, he pointed out in one part of, the, of this book that uh, they were making the same argument in his day when he was saying that things like uh, a minimum wage law wouldn't work uh, or, or uh, you know, and laying out the economic reasoning, he was accused of hating poor people. And so uh, if he was uh, making the case against high tariffs, uh, and in favor of free trade, well, he must hate uh, he must he must hate workers 
in general because they're being protected by protectionist tariffs, supposedly, in his day. So this is not a new argument, but uh, I'm sure everyone here, if you think about it, you've probably have heard that argument somewhere along the line in that how uncaring you are if you, if you oppose their particular program. And, uh, and, and that's what they do. And as von Mises wrote in, in Human Action, uh, labor unions in general have always been uh, probably the principal purveyors of anti-capitalistic propaganda uh, because it serves their purpose. Uh, and it serves their purpose uh, to, to tell people that uh, capitalists and business people are out to harm you uh, in, in every way imaginable. Therefore, you need a union to protect you. That's in their economic self-interest uh, to do that. And so they have always been that way uh, for the most part, although there have been, been some exceptions. And so those are the two examples I thought I'd give contemporary examples of how government is destroying America. But uh, the Fed and its antics and, uh, and the public employee unions, and I can't predict what's going to happen, but, uh, but uh, it was fun. I have to admit it was fun. I watched on television yesterday where these uh, uh, government bureaucrats were screaming their heads off in Wisconsin at, uh, at the state legislators who, just, who voted to uh, sort of end the gravy train uh, for them. And, uh, and I could see the veins bulging and the necks were all red, the faces were red and sputtering and spitting and chanting. That's basically what they do. Uh, and and uh, we have a few people from Baltimore here. A couple years ago, uh, 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 since I'm on unions, uh, every time I'd go downtown, like at the lunch hour, there was a group of people walking in a circle chanting something. And, I, and finally I got close enough that where I was doing business was near where they were. And for, like for a year, the same people walking in circles. This was during the housing boom. This is before the bubble burst. And I finally went over there and they're holding signs. I knew it had to do something to do with labor unions because they're walking in circles and yelling. And so <laughs> if you see a group of people walking in circles and yelling, you can bet it's probably organized by some labor union. And so that's what, and sure enough, they were, they were yelling, uh, uh, no pay, no, low pay, no way, low pay, no way. And uh, just walking by them, I think, uh, made me uh, legally uh, too, uh, have too much of a high blood alcohol content to get in my car and drive back to work. Just, just breathing in the air as I walked by them. And, uh, and, uh, and it turns out a Baltimore Sun reporter asked, went up to these people and asked who they were. They were mostly homeless people that were paid by the carpenters union to protest that their own, the carpenters were only being paid $20 an hour to build houses in, in Baltimore. And uh, the, the reporter asked the, the union guy, well, why, don't, why aren't there any actual carpenters here? And this was during the housing boom. And they said, uh, well, the, uh, the business is booming. And they, they can't afford it. They're making too much money uh, you know, working. And had the opportunity cost, they understand opportunity cost. It was too high. So they hired, they hired bums at below minimum wage. They actually found out they weren't even paying the minimum wage to walk in circles and scream, low pay, no way. And, uh, and they should have been protesting the union, paying them less than the minimum wage rather than, rather than this. But, uh, but that's the spectacle that we see in Wisconsin and elsewhere. So enjoy it while it lasts. And, uh, and that's about all I have time for.